Thank you guys for sticking to the bitter end. This is gonna be the best panel. It's so sad that everybody else isn't here. Um, anyway, uh, this is a, we've been talking a lot about tech. I've done a panel before this about tech, but this is a really great panel to talk about where innovations are going. Um, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that we did in the last panel I did around tech trends was relatively negative about AI. Uh, automation, robotics, and how they're going to kill the human race, essentially. Um, so we're going to talk about that issue and more, and where innovation's taking us. Um, but I'm going to have each member uh, of the panel introduce themselves, give a brief, brief bio, um, and then we'll get to talking about some, some questions and issues that, that we want to discuss. Let's start down here with you. Uh, I'm Michael Farrow. I'm chairman of Merrick Ventures, and uh, one of our assets is uh, Tribune Online Content, known as Tronk. And we're trying to figure out how we're applying data to help us monetize and uh, have real journalism content out there today that you can have that as accountability. I'm Bobby Kotick. I'm the CEO of Activision Blizzard, which is the world's largest video game company. And Marnie Levine, CEO of Instagram, um, social networking platform with over 700 million people in the community. We totally know what Instagram is, but go ahead. <laughs> Wait, what is it? <laughs> uh, my name is Evan Sharp. I'm the chief product officer and founder of Pinterest, which is a tool to design your life. All right. So we have about an hour, and we're going to have questions from the audience if there are any. But um, I want to start off uh, by talking about sort of the state of technology right now and where it stands. Um, there's a, we can talk a lot about where it's going and, and the big trends right now, which are AI. But uh, Michael, why don't you start talking about that and what you're hoping to do there? I mean. Uh, the idea of buying a newspaper company in this age is, is kind of an interesting move. Oh, I, I've heard that, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I've heard it from my wife, um, especially. <laughs> no, um, so it's basically where you get in. And so right now, it was so beat up that what we look at is that these brands are very important, these banners from the LA Times to the Chicago Tribune, that especially in the last 12 months, uh, the New York Times has been able to show this already, is that People need trusted brands to get news sources from. What we have to figure out is how we take all, these con all this content and be able to transform it so it works on every platform from Instagram to a Snap to Google, and how do we get even to the gamers? How do we start getting them involved in this? And we need help knowing what they want. So when we say we're applying AI or data mining to it is that we have to figure out what content people want, how to get it to them in the way they want it, uh, but on the newspaper side, it's actually alive and well. Uh, there are still a lot of people who like that user experience, mm -hmm. even though we have to, we're, we're aiming to how we get the millennials into it too. You're not going to. You could, you could tape a joint between each page, that might work. That might work for everybody, really. Well, we had a great, <laughs> well, we had a great conversation before, which I thought was a great idea. Yeah. Z to actually add eSports to the sports page. Right. Yeah. Well, well, that's the whole, I think, uh, that the media is still very relevant, the brands, is that I have a 15-year-old, a 17-year-old, a 19-year-old, they don't read newspapers, sorry. They, their dad owns them, they don't read them, but if they're in there, or one of their friends are in there, they suddenly use an Instagram or a Snap to take a photo of it and share it mm -hmm. with hundreds of thousands, because they still want to be authenticated. They want to still say they're relevant, and believe it or not, these brands, and so we were talking about how do we get the eSports players so that the masses know who they are and All they right. get that recognition. So, same thing, uh, Evan, I'm gonna go back and forth if you don't mind so everyone sure. gets a chance to talk. Um, talk about the trends that you're thinking are the most important at Pinterest right now. Obviously, Pinterest has started, uh, what, was, how, what would you call it? A, 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 like crafters, really, and people sure. sharing things like that. What do you think it's evolving into from your perspective? Sure, so we're focused on a lot of the, the trends other companies are. We have a lot of machine learning. We've been doing recommendations at scale for, for five, six years now. But a lot of what we're thinking about strategically is how we become not a social network, mm -hmm. right? How we don't focus on people sharing what they're doing every day, and instead okay. how we focus on helping people make better everyday decisions. Okay. So it's a little bit different. So you're not a social, trying to be not a social network. Well, we are not a social network. Yeah. People don't come to share what they're doing in right. their everyday lives. They come to get ideas for their future. It's very different. Right. So what are the big important trends you're thinking of when you're doing that? Because people do sort of put you in that bucket. Well, we think about personalization, right? It's how can you come to Pinterest and get something that's really, really relevant, a feed that's all about what's happening in your life. Mm -hmm. We think about how we get new ideas, new content onto our platform that's really relevant to the interests that people care about. Mm -hmm. And then also how we help people better understand what we're for, because we are very different. 
We're much more like a search engine, I would mm -hmm. say, than a social network, but we're not a search engine like Google. It's very visual, it's very discovery focused. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Bobby, what, do you, what are the tech trends that you think are the most important going forward right now? Well, I think Evan touched a little bit on machine learning and AI, and I think that has you know, great implications for what we're doing in gaming, but for us, um, you know, we're very focused on how you figure out how to give that sense of belonging to a greater number of people. You know, we operate 196 countries today, and what you find is that people who are engaged in game playing get a great sense of belonging and a sense of accomplishment, and now we're starting to see them being rewarded for their play, acknowledged for their play, celebrated for their play, and you know, those are things I think are really exciting that only the evolution of technology has enabled. Really? Because that's something that people used to get celebrated, acknowledged for their play. You mean on a worldwide basis? Well, for your physical prowess in your play. <laughs> but if you think about how accessible it now is to be able to compete in a game that gives, you know, the ability for, in a game like Overwatch, for example, we have 75,000 players of the 32 million players who are professional level. Mm -hmm. If you were to look at the NFL today, there might be 3,000 professional quality football players in the United States. So you have this incredibly accessible opportunity for you to showcase your talent in competition that didn't exist before mm -hmm. esports. So, Marty, you know, Instagram, obviously, we do know who Instagram is, but it's cha it has changed over time and started to grow like crazy recently. It's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon that Facebook bought it, obviously helped get it there and stuff like that. It was relatively small when it was bought. And then you took over the business part of it. What are the things you were thinking of uh, around where the tech trends are going for you? I mean, I think that, as you said, we're now a community of more than 700 million people. 400 million people come and use the service every single day. And the reason that they're coming is to stay connected to their friends and their family, to um, have, to connect with their passions and their interests. For me, I moved from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. It is, in fact, how I keep in touch with my friends and my family. It's how I'm seeing their kids grow up, really, truly, through the platform. And, you know, a colleague of mine, we were just talking about this the other day, he's really into woodworking. And he is connected so with sorry. a community of, well, no, 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 this is his craft. This is his passion. Yeah, I'm still sorry. And, Right, so you're not interested, and there are probably a lot of other people like you in San Francisco who he can't connect with mm -hmm. over that, mm -hmm. but he is able to find a connection with people around this. It inspires him, it gets him excited, mm -hmm. which is great. So he feels like he belongs to a different kind of community, which is, Im which is important. Mm -hmm. um, so f the things that we've been thinking about are how do we create the tools that more immersive tools so that you can feel closer to the people who you're trying to connect to. How do you connect to those communities of interest that are important to you? A lot of inspiration comes from businesses. So one of the things I've been really focused on is figuring out how to connect people to the business, to businesses that are providing the services and the things that are of interest to them. Advertising, essentially, correct? Well, or no, 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 no. So on the, on the platform itself, the vast, there, there are lots of businesses that are on the platform. Some have declared themselves as a business, some haven't. They tell their story in a very visual way. Some have become active advertisers, but some are just using Instagram as their storefront window, and it's how people understand what it is that they have, um, and it's, they can change it up. Um, it's how they find new customers, and so it's not necessarily just about advertising, it's really telling the whole story of what it is that you have to offer in a very visual way and a 360 degree view. Because the fact of the matter is, is that today, does business has become so personal. You wanna understand who is leading the business, what they're about, what their journey's been like, um, and not just the things that they're selling to you. I see. So you guys have all talked about one thing, which is the idea of community building, the, that they can. And one of the things that most people think about tech is that it's the anti antithesis of that, that, that it's not been a very good community builder, it, that it separates us, it creates us, you know. I, I, now, today, when I think about Twitter, I think of a hellscape, you know what I mean, uh, which includes the, the, the world's best troller, which would be our president. Um, and so... <laughs> Well, he's going to be happy you said he was best at something. Yes. So, by the way, it's, that's going to get quoted. May I also now. say, 
It's beautiful in an incredibly ugly way. Um, like he likes to say, it's beautiful. Uh, but you know, the idea of community is something that is lost on a lot of people because they feel like that it's not become that. Let's talk a little about the idea of community. Mark Zuckerberg in a 6,000 word essay discussed this, which please don't read. Read our story on it because it's real <laughs> long and is in desperate need of editing. Um, but it is, let's be honest. Um, but he's a good writer. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, it's, yes. It's, I feel like it's his, the Harvard thesis he never wrote because he didn't graduate. That's what I feel like it is. He gave you content to okay, write. Okay, let's, yeah, wa let's walk our way back to <laughs> yeah, communities. Okay, community. So, but he talked about the idea of, thank you, Bobby. Um, he talked about the idea of commu using, get, getting back to community and that we've lost this sense of community. So all of you said that word, the idea that, that tech is going to bring us community. Most people don't feel that. Who would like, why don't you start? Mr. I think Reagan. it is. I don't think it's going to. I think if you look at, you know, Marnie's example is a great one, but when you start thinking about video sharing and the ability to have voice over IP integrated into your experience so you can actually speak with the people that you're either connecting to or playing against, you know, I can only speak for our 450 million customers <laughs> around the world. Oh. <laughs> but um, th they sent... How many this, is that? There's 450. Okay, got it. By the way, I'm part of the Call of Duty community. <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to get special weapons right now. So, uh, no, I can tell you, it, I do play with hundreds of friends from where I make new friends around the world. And uh -huh. my son's in college, and we play while he's in college. It's actually a connector in many ways, technology that a lot of people don't know how to connect with their children. Video games is a great way okay. uh, to be doing that. All right, but talk about the concept of, of community, because a lot of people don't feel like it has. Separate, like that people become in these, you know, Mark has talked about it, that everyone's in these tranches, you don't have churches, you don't have community groups as, as heavily as people were, and they've been separated. So talk about how that happens. How we've actually yeah. seen changes in what yeah. constitutes a community? Right. I, I don't think it's technology's fault. I think that there are a whole host of other social ills and issues that have contributed to people not having the same embrace for religion, I mean, you know, the challenges of organized religion that we've seen around the world. And I think that there are things that are other than technology that have caused communities to fragment. People Offline losing, communities. People losing their jobs. You look at, you know, I don't know if you read Hillbilly Elegy, but yes, you have a great insight into what's happening in America that I think accounts for a level of dissatisfaction and hopelessness that we haven't seen in this country in my lifetime. And I think that the thing that we are getting the benefit of with technology is the ability to actually reconnect in ways that are different than the institutions of community that might be crumbling or not working as well as they could. So talk about that from a city perspective, because the LA Times was a joined people together and then went through all its various and sundry issues. Do you see it as that, or? Well, so I can, I was here last weekend, and the LA Times brand is such a great global brand, but locally, we had a almost 200,000 people at our book festival, mm -hmm. you know, at USC over the weekend. Uh, and then we have the big food festivals that people still get attracted to the brand. Uh, and globally, we have 30 million people from around the globe that where we're sitting right now is the bastion of culture for most of the world is not New York. It's right here in LA. And so for us right now, I, I, I'll use this example. I, everywhere I go in the world, I, I have holding companies, I'm an investor in multiple companies, and all I have to do is say I'm related to the LA Times, mm -hmm. and every door opens up. So no matter what country you're in, there's you still a value. just say, I'm a rich guy, let me in. No, that doesn't work, yeah. and I'm there's, not. Whoa, so, too many rich you know, there's guys. There's too many of those fellas. Yeah, they're all but, here. Yeah. yeah, but no, I actually, they're all, they are here. Yeah, I agree. Oh, I know. Um, so, no, I actually think that uh, all the journalism brands in Chicago, which of you in Chicago, uh, while I was waiting around, we were having people talk to us about the Printer's Row Book Fair, how important it is to them, where one of our leading civic citizens wants to make sure we're working on it because it brings communities together. And so our number one thing that happens, believe it or not, is opinion. So that when we write opinions, that's what so we, every study we do, that's what people are subscribing for. Mm -hmm. It's not just for the news, but from the opinion from trusted sources to kind of give them guidance of what's going on. And that is community building. And that's what Facebook, you know, our problem is Facebook and Google. It, it's hopefully an opportunity, but Facebook and Google uses our content 
to create communities. Mm -hmm. you know, they take our content and everybody comments and redistributes our content. We're just not getting paid. The wealth has been transferred there, but they absolutely use today what our great journalism to create their community. No, I've noticed but, that. But that probably is the reason you get 200,000 people to a book fair. I think I, I wanted to just take, take a second to, uh, for your observation about LA as the cultural capital of the world, because <laughs> it has actually become that. I think it's interesting, if you look at the cultural institutions in Los Angeles, let's take the LA County Museum of Art, the Symphony, you know, where you have Gustavo Dudamel or Michael Govan, two like, czars of culture. The way that people, and the, if you look at visitors in any of these cultural institutions in LA and how much they've increased in attendance over the last 10 years, and you would actually go talk to people about how they're finding out what's happening with their communities in these cultural institutions. It's Instagram, it's Facebook. That's how they're finding out. And it's drawing people to physical locations where they can have a physical connection. All right, that is the shiny happy version of it, but we're gonna get to what not, is not the shiny happy version of it. You know it. me, I'm only shiny happy. I, no, I got that, yeah. Um, <laughs> I so thought he was terrific, by the way. <laughs> yeah, um, so the, the idea, again, with community, do you, there, there is a question of whether this is the kind of communities we want, the way we want to be building, and how you, when Mark was addressing that in that essay, which you all read at Facebook, what do you think he was saying, and how do you look at it at, at Instagram? Well, the way we look at it is Instagram. There is a big community out there that is forming on Instagram. Um, the diversity of the community, you know, it's a global community, and so the chances are, if you're looking to connect with a passion or an interest, or if you're looking to connect with a, um, a friend from somewhere, they're probably on Instagram, and hopefully as more and more people uh, join, there will be more interests available, more businesses available, things to be able to connect with. But the thing is, is it's not one big monolithic community. There are communities within the communities, as I was explaining, the woodworking one. You know, somebody who connects to a small business, there becomes a community around that. There's your group of besties, if you will. You know, people that you keep in touch with on a very regular basis, other people who you're keeping in touch with um, in other ways. And I think that's really important. What people are doing when they come to Instagram is that they're telling their story in a very visual way. So through an image of some sort, uh, they are communicating what they're doing, how they're feeling, who they're with. Sometimes they're making some issue that is invisible to other people visible by sharing it. And by putting themselves out there and sharing and telling their story in that way, they get a response from people. And the response may come in the form of support. Let's say you're dealing with an eating disorder, or let's say um, you are dealing with depression or isolation, or you're LGBTQ and you are in a small town and you don't see anybody who looks like you, you don't have anybody to talk about it with. When people go out there and they tell their story in that visual way, other people connect to them. They either get support or they're able to um, provide support to other people and inspiration for other people. So I think depending on what is going on, um, communities form in different ways, and it's powerful. I've heard people, different people time and again, I've heard people who dealing with eating disorders that say Instagram was integral to their recovery. Mm -hmm. They got support, they understood other people were going through what they were going through, they didn't feel so alone. I've heard pe trans people who have talked to me about the fact that they didn't have anybody to talk to about it. They watched somebody documenting their transition and understood that there was somebody out there like them. If you are in a small town and you like reading Jane Austen on a Saturday night, rather than going to a football game, you can connect with other people who read books and talk about that. And so you feel less alone in the world. And I think that that's the importance of, that is what we get from our physical community around us. Not everybody has it. And so when you're part of a broader community like that, you can actually find it. That was the promise of the internet when it began. And yeah. I think it's, and I, and I think it is actually, I think it's coming to life in a, in, in a great way. Can I add one more point? All right. Which is just that it connects to your point about journalism, which is that it also creates this um, understanding and empathy of other things that are going on in the world. One of my favorite examples is Time Inc. has this um, account that they have on Instagram called Finding Home. Mm -hmm. And it documents uh, three refugees and their families as they seek a new life. And you see them every day 
through an Instagram story and what it takes to establish a new life somewhere. You see the fear in them. You see like the hard work that it takes. You see how foreign everything seems, just things that we take for granted. And you get this deeper context and this deeper understanding of what's going on in different places in the world. That's a different kind of community. Yeah, it's interesting. Although a lot of Instagram, though, is like pretty pictures of people on ski vacations and meals and stuff like that. I'm thinking of doing an Instagram feed of doing just awful things. Like, I'm going to have my kids smoke and drink and <laughs> start to put up those. Well, no, so you raise a great point, which is that, first of all, I think that people on Instagram, what they were doing is they were showing a lot of the highlights. Yeah. And what we realized and understood is that life is definitely more than just highlights. Mm -hmm. um, if I am baking a cake, it's, it's not that my cake in the end would be a highlight, but it's the one that I dropped on the floor before or the one that burned. That's actually part of life. It's messier, it's deeper, it's richer. The issue was that people didn't have a way to express that because they had come up with these curated mm -hmm. profiles and they were telling a certain story about their life but not the full picture. And so that's why we introduced Instagram stories because it was a place where they could share all of their moments and right. not just that right. one type of a moment. I'll be kind here and not say you introduced it. You borrowed it rather extravagantly. Well, we, 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 we took a format that was Popular introduced by somebody else, at another site, and we adapted it adapted. and introduced it to the Instagram community you do not in get, a very instagram you, way. You do not get paid enough by Facebook for that way. You <laughs> that. Anyway, um, you, I, I'm going to say get a raise for you for that one. Thank um, you. Uh, no problem. Um, I've been talking about that idea of visual, visualization and, and community because one of the things you all do is you do, one of the things that happened on Pinterest very early was these creations of communities that just happened. Um, one of the ones I remember, um, it, there was a whole group of people that loved everything about Fifty Shades of Grey. It was like a whole pack <laughs> of people. I missed that one. I don't, it was. It was there. It was there oh, for no. a big... It was pointed out to me by, I think, Ben, your founder. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure why he did that. But, um, <laughs> but it was an interesting thing, and they were obsessive about it. It was, really, it was a really interesting thing. And I, I remember, because I wrote a book on AOL, this was a really early thing with AOL, is people finding each other. Um, which was fascinating. Quilters would find each other, or they would find other people like them, gay people, stuff like that. Um, how do you look at it now, like the idea? Because I do think there is the hope that this happens, but often people feel um, empty during it, during or before. I don't think I feel tremendous after an hour on Twitter or an hour on Facebook all the time, sometimes. It's a great question. There's a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, the community of Pinterest has always been a little bit different. You know, I worked at Facebook many years ago and I joined Instagram the first day and I, I love both of those services. Just posted a post yesterday. But Pinterest has always been a place that celebrates failure as much as success. You know, mm -hmm. Pinterest fails has always been a meme for us. One of the best things on Pinterest is, you know, the Cookie Monster cupcake pin you see and then what you're actually made. Mm -hmm. And the difference is hilarious. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is a little bit of a, dif of a difference between how people are using Pinterest and how they're using social services. And we have the saying internally, be yourself, not your selfie, yeah. that I think kind of well sums done. it up. It wasn't me. Okay, um, I like it anyway. Than the team. Um, you know, and I think the, the downside of the social experience, at least for me as a user, which is not a huge downside, but is you end up sometimes feeling like anxious because there are people who have better lives than you, right? And so that gap can make people feel insecure and hesitant to try something new. And, and I think Pinterest is a place that we try and make really safe. We try and make it okay to fail. We try and make it a place where you're not gonna get judged. And that, that allows you to experiment, to be open to possibilities, to maybe get over that fear of doing something new. And you know, I think I'm a huge gamer. At least I grew up playing Activision and Blizzard games. And I think there are different kinds of games, right? There are games you play where you're competing like Call of Duty, and then there are games you play where you're not, where you're playing like an instrument, where you're building something and there's not actually a competition or, or an end goal. Pictures is a little bit more like the second kind of game. Which is, which is not to compete. Not it's open-ended, it's creative, it's about building, it's about possibilities. My favorite brand for Pinterest is actually Lego. Mm -hmm. Their brand values and ours are almost identical. Okay. The difference is Pinterest is Legos for your life. Oh. Right? It's about bricks, it's about everyday decisions that add up to something that you get to have control over and be creative about. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about where AI and, and uh, I'm going to use AI in a broader sense, is what you think the big technology is coming that all of your companies have to pay attention to. Um, obviously, AI is the big talk of Silicon Valley right now, both for negative and positive. Again, a lot of people feel it's going to be great that you'll be able to just think something and then Jeff Bezos deliver it to your house that minute. Um, other people feel fear. That's why I have my Prime subscription. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> other people feel fear, like Elon Musk. We had him at Code last year, and he talked about how AI was going to get so smart that it's going to start treating human beings like house cats, um, which I thought was interesting. They don't want, he was saying they don't really want to kill us. They don't care. They're like, we're like going to be like house cats to them. Um, so talk about sort of the promise of what's coming. He did. He really did say that. But then he said we're all in a simulation, so it doesn't really matter. Anyway. I'm always grateful when he says that because <laughs> we're the best at controlling simulations. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Except that you're a made-up thing right now. I don't know if Well, that's a simulation. <laughs> yeah. Right. I would think I would be taller if it was a simulation. But um, if, if we really were in control of the simulation, exactly. I would have you taller. Oh, thank you so and, much. And a better baker. Okay, good. That's true. We, <laughs> that's another story. Um, so can you, I'll talk, why don't you start with you, Michael. Like, what do you think, what, are the, what is the key thing for your business going forward? The key trend that you're watching because so, <clears throat> it does feel like Silicon Valley is getting more in a serious bent on certain things. You know, the fear of AI right now in, in our world, in the industry I'm currently in, it was great. So I came out of healthcare last mm -hmm. year and, and helped build its Watson Health. But in journalism, we have a problem. And when I talk to all the other institutions, is that it used to be that when you just had print. There was a discovery that you would read that how people read a newspaper, you know, you scan it and you find something interesting that you may not, uh, it's a game, that you may not have thought you'd wanna read before. It's like, it was like Pinterest. But now because of AI and machine learning and everybody in Google and Facebook and all these great programs out there, is my children right now are getting fed exactly what they want. Everybody knows what to send them all the time. And there's a problem with that is that if, if your discovery is taken away and people start understanding what you like and they keep feeding you and feeding you that, you don't ever get any broccoli. There, there's no discovery. We're trying to figure out how can we, like we were actually talking earlier, I was like, how do we bring esports in the mainstream? How do we go after millennials? How do we make health a topic? How do we make environmental issues that we get it out there and I can still get my 17 year old to click on that? Mm -hmm. Because right now, the way everyone gets paid with AI when it comes to data and journalism is based on they need you to click, so they want to show you whatever it is that you're going to click on versus right. discovery. Right. That's it, a big problem, and I've talked to Alon, it is a big problem right what, now. What, do you, what is your solution? It is, it is a slot machine for attention, really, and, and there's people working at uh, all these companies. I, I don't know if that gives audiences enough credit. I think, I don't have to say this to you as a journalist, but. I think one of the challenges of journalism today is there's a little bit too much A and not enough I. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that if you start to, if, when you make right things or present things that are compelling or interesting, people will find them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's gonna change because of AI. I think people will find them, but you don't get paid for them. That's really a problem from, for, the, for the economics of it. You know what, I, I don't know enough about how you get paid, so I can't N speak to that. Not but, well, but go ahead. But uh, you have very fancy alligator shoes. No, they're, they're really old. <laughs> anyway. Um. Uh, but uh, I think when you think about these trends in technology that are actually having positive influences, you know, AI is often talked about, uh, you know, from the perspective of someone who we develop a lot of AI. Yeah. I don't share exactly the same near-term concerns that others do about the dangers of AI. I think there's more benefit than detriment. I would say... If you were to think about the negative consequences of human decision making and human intelligence, they're more likely in our lifetimes to be of greater negative consequence than the consequences of AI. Having said that, you were asking about sort of trends in technology that are going to be impactful and differentiated that don't maybe get as much attention as you would think. And uh, Yuri Milner's in the other panel, but we were talking last night. Uh, if you think about quantum computing and what the impact on society could be of molecular level computing mm -hmm. and how much we've seen it, genuine advances in material sciences. Mm -hmm. I would say that for a trend in technology is the most exciting Absolutely. area. Absolutely, you're 100% right. The idea of, but how does that apply to you? Not at all or? Well, in so many ways. I mean, if you think about, I'll, I'll give like a specific example to my business, but you know, we're, we have esports tournaments around the world. 
One of the things that I think would be fascinating and interesting in regular sport or e-sport is if I could actually capture body data and I could be able to use that and I could do things like change the material so that it would heat or cool me as I'm playing and getting overheated or not, you know, take the sensory data and see what's actually happening as it re relates to my game experiences. I think those are fascinating, interesting things that ultimately are going to improve the entertainment experiences that we create. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an area of science that it gets a lot of attention from the people who are focused on it, but maybe not enough attention for how meaningfully it can change society. Mm -hmm. Material sciences, absolutely. No, quantum computing. Quantum computing, right, okay. Um, so, and that is gonna affect your, you feel like it's gonna affect your business, or you don't, you're like? I, it will affect every, every part, every walk, way of life. All right, and how do you, what do you look at as the most important tech trend that's among, most people do point to AI in terms of improving their businesses. I know Facebook's made a huge investment along with Google. I don't know, I mean, when I think about from where I sit at Instagram, we're, it's, it's all about getting you connected with the people who you want to be connected with so that you're, in fact, strengthening those relationships and being able to keep in touch, that you're able to have shared experiences together. I think that what we found in the past is that um, people weren't necessarily seeing all the content that they wanted to be seeing and they weren't connecting necessarily with the people who they wanted to be connecting with. And so getting smarter about being able to do, being able to do that so, um, so that they could keep in touch and have those, so have those relationships. And so, but also to be able to um, communicate and to tell their stories in the way that they want to be able to uh, tell them, which is why, as we talked about before, we introduced Instagram stories and also to be able to express themselves differently. I think people still today, when they think about Instagram, they think of it as being a photo sharing app. And over, you know, over the past few months, consumption of video has just exploded. Mm -hmm. And video has become a much bigger thing. And then there are these other things that aren't quite video, but boomerangs, which are looping, looping videos, different way, looping gifts, different ways to be able um, uh, to express yourself. So that is mostly right now, like one of the ways that we're, we're focused. I think there's one other thing too, as the community grows to more than 700 million, um, we feel like we have a real responsibility to um, maintain a safe environment for people to be able to share. And what I mean by safe is that people can express themselves and are able to have some control over the way that they are expressing themselves. Uh, so we've introduced tools um, to help turn off comments, to filter out words that you might not want to see in your comments so that you feel safe being able to um, share and express yourself and get that benefit of putting yourself out there. That's something we're really focused on. Could you, you, I think you could probably talk about this, what, what Facebook did today. Yeah. Explain what Facebook did today. So what Facebook did today, what Mark announced is that um, he is adding 3,000 people to our community operations. That's in addition to the 4,500 that are around the world. So, so when doubling. you think about it, yeah, essentially doubling it. But when you think about it here, the, the way the platform works is that Somebody posts something, somebody reports it, and then there is this community operations team that responds to the report and makes a determination of whether it violates the policy that govern the platform. And um, so the best thing that we can do is improve our response times, and the way to do that is twofold. One is to have more people looking at those reports, and two is to be able to have better tools in order to respond um, to the reports. Some of the nature of the reports are pretty routine, others are more serious, somebody might be in imminent harm or danger, and we need to be able to get them in the hands of professionals or in the so hands of law enforcement. this is in response to the killing, video, the, the killing video? I think this is in response to a, to a whole host of things, there were but, it is, there but there, have been some, there have been some really awful things that have played out on the platform. Let me ask you a question. This was not, I, I did have a discussion with some Facebook people when they introduced Facebook Live, and I, I didn't even say it offhandedly. I said, oh, someone's gonna kill someone on that platform. 
And everyone's like, oh, Carrie, you're so negative. And I was like, okay, but I'm, I'm thinking of where well, you it could are. go. You are. I am very You're negative. always, yes. or, yeah, you are. No, but I bit. thought that's the first thing I thought of was like, uh-oh. Like, no, but it, give everyone a tool, they're going to do something awful. Which, which I think you're, which I think you're right to think about, and I, and I know that we have thought about these things too, but I think, so live is, has become extremely popular too. Mm -hmm. On Facebook, it exists in one form, on Instagram, yeah, it's, it's, it's different. The, the way live works on Instagram is that it disappears, it only lasts for the period in which you are broadcasting. And what live really is used for is to hang out with your friends. So imagine you're a teen, and you get home from school and you're in your room because you were told that you couldn't go hang out with your friends and you have homework to do. Um, if you turn on live, you are suddenly transported and you can hang out with your friends. You can do homework or you can talk. And that is like, that is something that we've been doing. I, I know when I was a kid, I would open up a party line and we would talk to a bunch of people and we would chat about different things. So now we have new technologies to be able to do that for live. There are, the vast majority of the interactions are like that. It's people hanging out with people. Live, is, live is, is exploding. People are using it all the time. You're hearing about these other cases. They're horrible, and, um, and we need to make sure that um, they're addressed as soon as possible so that people don't get exposure to them, but also that we can get people into the hands of law enforcement or right. professionals. But it can't be good for that. Like, if that's, it dominated the headlines that the, the, the murder did, absolutely. Yeah. Is there, Evan, do you have uh, work on visual search? You know, instead of having to add yeah. 3,000 people to yeah. do that work, is there, like I would think Pinterest would be yeah, at the forefront of interesting visual search. Thanks for asking. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've invested in that for many years, and we just launched a product a couple months ago called Lens that allows you to search the world around you with your phone, with the camera in your phone, kind of the way you look around and browse things. You can use your phone to search. And that's AI, that's called computer vision. It's a new kind of AI that's becoming commodified, and that's increasingly going to make things like understanding what's in an image really easy. It's gonna take a few years before it's effective enough that can replace 3,000 people working for you, but it's coming. So talk about what, you, Pinterest started off as a visual media and always been, what are the big trends that you see that are important to the business or, the, or that are gonna shift them? Is it a AI? Is it, is it yep. AI or AR or VR or what's the? AR and VR are irrelevant. Um, AI is very relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of live in the age of the objective function. If you know what objective function is, that's how no, you optimize please explain. towards. Actually, in journalism, the objective function used to be Pulitzers. Oh, OK. All right. right? Mm -hmm. That was what you optimized. We still for. like to win those, by the way. We're not out, and we like those. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And now it's changed to be engagement and eyeballs, which is just change. It's disruption, mm -hmm. good, good or bad. They but still so, like the Pulitzers, but go ahead. No, no. <laughs> but, um, so artificial intelligence is, I, I think it's just a capability. It's a new tool, and like all tools, it's incredibly effective, and so it'll be very destructive, and it'll be very constructive, and we have to learn how to use it. It's particularly scary to me for many reasons. And I'd say the visual aspect, the visual nature of how we think about Pinterest is very relevant. Like Instagram, I think we have a lot in common there. The world is becoming very visual. And that makes sense. We're visual creatures. We look at the world around us. 80% of the data that hits our, our cerebral cortex, sensory data is visual data. And there's a lot of space ahead of us, ahead of the whole industry, to really understand how to make using technology a lot more natural and fluid so that it feels much more like we interact with the world around us. Much more. Using, using the internet, using digital technology, shouldn't feel like you're typing. Yeah. Right? It should feel much more natural. Ultimately, it'll become much more like the sensory. So let's get into where that's going. Because I think a lot of, there's, I've seen a lot of stuff lately around VR, AR, um, still in its nascent stages. You have to have the very, the big headset. You're being dragged around by cords. Um, it's not ready for prime time in any way. But talk a little bit further out as how you look at a service like Pinterest. And I want each of you to think about, you're, you're easy. The game thing, you could see people doing a lot of things. But uh, talk about how it affects sure. you. It's, you know, and, and some people, see, people always separate AR from VR, which I think they shouldn't necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's someday you're gonna walk in this room and it can become a game. Like the room becomes a game. You don't have to stand in a white room and interact with fake things. Your living room becomes the gaming platform or whatever. Yeah, but today I think that 
the definition of AR as most people understand it. It's, it's glasses. Little, and it's, but it's more, it's more of an accessible, like if you think about Pokemon Go as a great AR yeah. example, I think it seems like it's a little more accessible today. But I think you're gonna see, like anything else, you'll have, a, a low, you'll come lower down the cost curve, you won't have the same disorientation that you have in VR that you have today, and it will be a, a new prevalent way of being exposed to the universe. But how? how? What do you imagine? Well, from our perspective, you talk about how you create a, a different level of immersion. You know, regardless of the game experience, the immersion that you, even in just real-time 3D experiences that you have today with 3D glasses, when you add that extra layer of immersion, the experience itself becomes much more visceral. It has the potential to become more emotional. Ours is more of a visceral medium today. Mm -hmm. And I think that level of immersion is going to create entirely new ways of entertaining. So you also talked about wearing materials, and haptic would be important. Haptic touching, haptic Absolutely. whatever. It, it could go any direction, obviously. Well, for us, anything that's going to give you a greater sense that, you know, if you think about the experiences that we deliver. So let's take something, I think like Evan was referring to, but uh, Guitar Hero. You know, unleashing your inner rock star is an essential interactive fantasy. The more immersive it is, the more you actually feel like you are performing as a rock star, that you're getting the <laughs> adulation of the audience, that you're actually being able to feel that experience of standing on a stage and performing. You know, that, that will be an enriching entertainment experience. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do that? I, I, ha I am so unadept at anything in performance or music. I'm tone deaf, as you know, mm -hmm. and not just my musical uh, <laughs> aptitude. But uh, no, I, I, yeah, I would actually like that experience. I think you're selling yourself short. I think yeah. you got a good song from Hamilton. Yeah. <laughs> you so, got your song. Um, it, what about in journalism? We, we think AR, so for us, there's the AR is we're actually working on multiple prototypes right mm -hmm. now. So the best way to this explain is it is reality. the Harry Potter newspaper mm -hmm. is how we call it. Is that we look at an experience that the user experience of how someone reads a paper is a very unique thing for hundreds of years. There's a reason it works. And if you actually watch people, there's a, a whole study we've been doing that. What if we can bring it? We are actually bringing it to life that when someone gets it, it's a little piece of lucite. <laughs> that lights up and that instead of pushing and pressing things, things just happen as you move. So we're actually working where the photos are coming to life. You don't have to press video. It just, you've seen some of this already, but even when you see the offer that you want to like, then you press something if you actually want so you know, would that in, download. In that scenario, would say news change by the second? It could change by the second. Well, right? actually, the other thing is that is interesting that we have found, so we now have a million paid subscribers that we announced today, both of all subscribers, we have a million people a year paying us a subscription, you know, and hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue. And they like, it's very important that what they don't like, they like the e-paper mm -hmm. more than the website. Now this is very important because people like a beginning and end of a story and know that I'm getting something that I know if I start and end that it's, they don't like that it changes all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have the change, but there's a large, part of the population that you don't want your book always changing. You, you like to read a story, and the news is really important that someone needs to know that if I'm reading this, that you haven't changed it on me. I'm gonna get all my scores. I'm gonna find out everything that happened, and when I wanna get to it, I get to it, and but, I have my 30 minute to 60 minute experience. But it's called news, right? I mean, you want it to be new, correct? Well, but new is only good. Uh, it's great when you get your headline news, but if you suddenly keep popping in and people don't get Right. If they miss something, right. they don't they don't get the other stories. The uh, no, slice of life. I get thing. the concept. Of, like today, it's like healthcare. Yes, no. Yes, no. Yes, no. And, it's and so it's very so. That's the reason that we, yes, our no. e-paper is growing exponentially uh, for subscribers as they want that experience. They want to know. That's number one thing we've heard is that they want to know that it doesn't change and that they know if it's changed. They still like. We always have the option, right? Yeah. Constant. Constant. I've just news. noticed on a lot of news apps, they change really rapidly now. I mean, the New York Times front page was seven times today. Was yeah, right, it, it changes. We, st we have all that, of course, but we also have the other version, which is the one that we get our subscribers with. Oh, interesting. Um, what about Instagram in the future? What does that look like? Because you're not going to have Are we still on AR, VR? Yeah, AR, VR. Yeah, because yeah. you're not going to have just an app. Like, the whole phone experience is, should be over relatively soon, I, I think. Really? I think yes. 
think the I phone do. is like an important. No, it's going to be gone. But we'll we'll see. No, I think when we talk about things like AR, VR, I sort of feel like we talk about AR like it's like this really far thing in the future. But the fact is that there's it's it's there's a there's a continuum, and I think we're already in AR. I see it every day on a platform like Instagram. You know, there's some you know, there's your life, and people are augmenting it somehow with some sort of a drawing, or they're putting on some sort of a mask, or they're, they're, they're bringing in things from other parts of the world into the image that they're, that they're sharing with other people, and so they are, in fact, augmenting their reality, and it's part of, it's part of the transformational experience of, like, telling the story in the way that you want to be able to, um, in the way that you want to be able to tell it. I think in the future, I mean, obviously, I'm part of the Facebook company. Oculus is a big part of, of Facebook. We talk to them about different kinds of things. I don't know, necessarily know what the future holds, but because well, people come to... Give me an to, imagine, like you well, suddenly imagine, are in someone's damn picnic or well, something. Well, I'm, like, I'm saying, I mean, you could imagine, since, since one of the things you probably do today is that you might go to a museum and you might share that photo of being at the museum. You could imagine sitting on a bench at the Louvre, like looking at the Mona Lisa, that's the kind of experience you're having a shared experience with someone and you're sharing what it is that you're doing. That is the essence of what Instagram is today. Mm -hmm. So you could imagine that happening in a virtual reality kind of a context. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you would see it changing? Again, it's, I don't think it's gonna be in these apps. It's sort of like when you think of Google search, we're not gonna be typing words into a box. It's just like, I don't know why that's not over 14 minutes ago. I think, it's, I think it's more of like what the vision is, like what is the kind of, what's the objective, what's the kind of experience that you want to have, and then the, the channel or the device is mm -hmm. something different. I think it may still be happening within the community. So you're really talking about you becoming a video company in a lot of ways. Well, video has, I mean, again, I think most people think of it as being a photo sharing app, and video is huge on Instagram. What about Pinterest? Um, our head of design, who's a dear friend, ran Xbox for many years, and he ran the VR program there. He says the only, outside of story, and so VR is obviously an incredible storytelling medium. It, I can just tell using it. My best friend's a writer, I just had lunch with him, he wrote Stranger Things, that show. It is going to be the best oh. storytelling medium of all time. But you gotta put freaking goggles on, no one's gonna do that, unless they're playing a game or watching a movie or maybe talking to their friends. And so I think in storytelling situations, like communication or entertainment, it's gonna be killer. But other than that, it's fundamentally a hardware issue. Right? Until it's they an fix input it. output issue. Right. People aren't gonna wear glasses all the time. They're not gonna be holding up their phones. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's not that relevant in a day-to-day -day use case situation. Until there's a platform that hundreds of millions of people are using, it's not worth our investment as a small company right. trying to grow and be independent. But you wouldn't see something like it comes out in front of you and you start moving it around. Like uh, the, that movie with Tom Cruise. I try never to watch Tom Cruise I movies, but report. this was great. Yeah, yeah, uh, my report. No, I mean, my background's design and architecture, so I'm right. always thinking about the user. My arms get tired really quickly even just thinking about that. Oh, really? That's not gonna happen. But what August, our head of design, does say is the one non-entertainment use case that's really killer for VR is looking at your room and using Pinterest and figuring out what furniture goes in there. So there are a few things, but they're very right. specialized. Right, interesting. Yeah. All right, we have any questions from the audience? We've just got a few more minutes left. Questions? Questions? Anyone? No, you're all too tired. Okay. Um, I want to finish up uh, right here. One in the front. Right here, one in the there. front. Why don't you bring this down here? Stand up. Go ahead and start. I'll get to you. From where? From Ghana. Ghana, wow. fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, with respect to AI, because most of it is entertainment, how can AI be used through entertainment to still impact the social lives, the educational lives, the health lives of people around the world, particularly in the developing world? Right. Thank you very much. That's a great question. How can, how can AI be used to help uh, in other ways that aren't just a video game. I would say, I don't want to get too technical, but within AI, the most simplest form, like a zero order inference engine, you, you actually could personalize learning today very easily and you don't need sophisticated AI to do that. And if you think about how difficult it is to get resources to schools in developing countries, if you had the ability to actually have personalized learning capabilities, which exists today in many forms, I think that can have more of an impact 
you're gonna bypass some of the things that schools don't do a great job at teaching, and then you can actually start focusing on the things that are really hard to teach, like character and integrity and leadership, and you can actually leave it to personalized learning programs to educate people in for not a lot of money or, and not a lot of cost. And I think that you know, that's a way where very simplified forms of AI, AI could have a very big impact today. And what about healthcare? Anybody? I mean, AI, AI is, all that matters is the data you have, because AI just works with data. So if you have any data, AI doesn't do anything. And so when I'm, I don't have an answer, but you need to start with what data set do you have that's large enough for AI to be something that's effective? You know, what can AI do that humans couldn't do? And usually it's based on some very, very large data set that you need to make sense of and do a job across. So I don't know, actually. That's not yeah, helpful. Okay. But. Well, w thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, last question I'm going to ask, we just have a few minutes, I'd love you all to answer this. There was just a recent interview that uh, Steve, uh, Sam Altman, who runs Y Combinator, uh, had their tr trying universal basic income in Oakland right now. There are 100 families, they're going to move to 1,000. But one of the things he was talking about was the future of jobs, when you're thinking about all these different technologies. I think it's a really big concern, more so than people realize, um, through automation, AI, robotics, uh, all these things that have self-driving cars alone, millions of jobs, millions and millions of jobs disappear. Where do they go? He said the only, he said, if you have a repetitive job that doesn't have an emotional or creative connection, you will be out of a job. Yeah, yeah. What do you all think of that? I don't think all right, Each of you respond. Well, you start. So by the way, I, I actually, um, card-carrying libertarian, but I am actually very interested in the basic income yeah. concept that it was at, we, I was at TED Talks and the two TED Talks had it in. Yeah. And, and I've been spreading the word going, I think we really, really need to look at this because I do believe when AI comes, Uber's already drivers, you, people are not going to need cars at their house, they're going to be able to Lease cars, grow, houses are going to be built differently. Everything's going to change healthcare. Uh, so that's my old field. AI is doing great things, and there's going to be a lot that we can help the world with. But so many jobs, it's not just repetitive jobs. Right. It is. I actually think the, the blue collar workers could be a little safer than a lot of white collar workers right now. Mm -hmm. So I do think we yeah, have to lawyers, think about. Lawyers, radiologists, uh, accountants. There's so many things that are going to get disintermediated. It's not necessarily the blue collar workers, it's actually white collar workers High that have to worry. Jobs. Right, right, high paying jobs. Mm -hmm. They're gonna get switched out. So I do think we have to think about it. I do think the shift is coming and it, it's a little scary. Bobby, uh, since you're so happy and shiny, it'll be fine, we'll find something else. That's no, what's I, look, I think You've been hanging out with the we're, Facebook We're in a productive much. economy. There's an enormous amount of opportunity. It will not be afforded to people who have a public education in this country. Mm -hmm. When the state of California spent $70 billion trying to educate K through 12, an average grade level is like at 30% across every subject, we're failing students. And so unless you change, fundamentally change the way that you educate children in this country, these jobs that are available are not going to be available here. They're gonna be available in places where they do a better job educating their citizens. And for the US to be as, as behind as it is in educating through public education, educating students, it's a disgrace. And what about jobs that actually get replaced? Like he was talking about self-driving cars, self-driving trucks. I think there's four million. Marty just talked about 3,000 new jobs that Facebook created today. Right. I can tell you we can't find enough people to satisfy the needs of our company. We are, we, we are growing our employee base, but finding capable people is a very difficult thing to do, and it is the challenge of education in this country. There are jobs. And there will be more once these get... They're nothing but opportunity when you actually take advantage of these technologies in the appropriate ways, but you have to educate your citizens in order to provide the high quality jobs that are necessary. Okay, Marnie, and then we'll finish. I want to also take the, oppor the optimistic perspective on this, okay. uh, which is that um, one of my favorite parts of this job is meeting these people who actually kind of become unexpected entrepreneurs. So I think what technology is doing, it is creating all these unexpected opportunities for people that they never knew that they had. Mm -hmm. um, so the education matters, but I also think it's what they do with it. So I was in LA a couple weeks ago, and I met this woman who decided, who had always been really interested in letter press, in letter press. and she went from being a, uh, a producer of commercials to doing this full time for her job. And I hear stories like this, all around this country and all around the world where um, 
the platform, the community, like Instagram, has created opportunities that they never thought that they had, that they become entrepreneurs. They manage it all. They manage their entire business from their mobile phone. They're advertising, they're marketing, their customers, mm -hmm. what they say, for very little money, for free, on the, um, on the platform. And just one other thing. In Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, there are 4,000 Instagram-fueled businesses. The vast majority of those are run by women. This isn't a country where women are not able to drive and often need you know, a male escort to be able to go and do various things in their society. And the Minister, the minister of Labor has taken note of this and is trying to quantify um, the, the income from these the revenue from these companies and to include it as part of GDP because it's so significant. I think this is happening all around the world and so I think there is there are all these opportunities there that are opening up and it's fueled by technology. Well, two observations on that. It would be nice if we could teach everyone to be entrepreneurial. I, that's, I think the problem is not everybody is. It, Except for that within a community, and that's another form of community, they are mentoring each other. They teach each other. They get together in the offline world and through online. They tell each other what the best practices are and they inspire them to take the risk and go and do it. Okay. And last? Um, Oof. Oof. You can do it. Bring um, it home. I mean, universal basically becomes a tactic, right? So what's the goal? It's the question no one can answer. The goal is people have the freedom to choose the life they want to live, helping them have enough resources to support their family, helping them find a role in society that brings them dignity and fulfillment. And so I agree with Bobby. You know, giving people knowledge, encouragement, inspiration, helping them be creative, trying to give them the opportunity to, to make something out of life. I don't know. But there's a lot of change coming. And even creative snowflakes like me are going to be out of a job. It, what? Even creative snowflakes, right? It's right. not just the white collar workers, it's the music. I mean, everybody can be replaced in a way mm -hmm. by, by programming and by bots. So. All right, then. All right. On that note, you're all going to be replaced by bots. Okay, thank you. Sure.